All right, we are in the book of Ephesians. Um, again, I pray everyone has had an opportunity to um, read ahead. Uh, you want to read the whole, oh, bless you. Um, I'm going to read the whole book uh, all over again. That, you know, I did. Um, but it seems like every chapter that you read, you get we get more and more insight into who we are, who we've been called to be, what our position is in God now. Um, and here in, in chapter three, I think it really spells out even more who we are as Gentiles, uh, how we've been brought into the family, how we've been uh, not treated as stepchildren, but treated as part of the family like any other being. You know, blood, it, it, it's, it's, it's not about that. It's all about how our faith in God has allowed us to become a part of the family of God and to dwell in. So you're gonna, we're going to do this on each one, again, of the, the entire review of the book of Ephesians. Hope you don't get tired of that, but I want you to keep in mind, you know, about the book. They're again, written by the Apostle Paul, written around 60 to 62 AD. Uh, the letter was written by Paul while he was in prison. Uh, Paul did a lot of things. Uh, he did a lot of ministry. He was a, a great missionary. But um, when he was arrested, when he had to go and uh, be away from those churches, you know, being in prison, word got back to him about how things were, uh, especially in the city of Ephesus, which was an immoral city, highly sexualized city dominated by Roman and Greek culture. I found it so interesting that in both cultures, cultures, they had certain gods. Romans had their set of gods. The Greeks had their set of gods um, that they worshiped. You know, now here comes Paul, uh, introducing the one and only God, the one who speaks back, the one who does not have a, uh, a, 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 a statue or something that is tangible, but the God who is the creator of everything. And so he begins, you know, in the church, and he's introducing Christ to the people living in a city who were already dominated by so many different theological uh, uh, differences. But the strength of what Paul had to bring to them caused them to begin to now honor and worship the true God. Uh, he helped establish this church uh, on his third missionary journey, and he stayed in Ephesus working in this church, building up this church, building up the ministers and, you know, encouraging the saints for three years. And once he left, that's when a lot of the false teaching that was starting to creep in back, you know, creep into the church. People were coming in and they were, you know, upset now because uh, some of the things that Paul had been preaching and teaching had started to affect uh, certain financial uh, sectors because people were not buying uh, the statues that they had been buying or anything that was related to um, the immoral ways of life. They were not visiting the Temple of Diana where all the prostitutes were. Uh, they were, you know, really becoming uh, centered in Christ Jesus. So in order for them to, you know how they say, when the cat's away, the mouse will play, so Paul is gone. So now you got false teaching and everything is starting to come into the church. And Paul gets wind of this. So he had to write a letter of encouragement to refute some of this teaching and to bring encouragement back into the people. And I've said it before, you know, as a pastor, and it is so true, one of the hardest things uh, for a pastor to do is to get believers to continue to believe. Uh, it's one thing to convert someone 
uh, from uh, unbelief to now begin them to start believing. The Bible tells us we're overcomers by the blood of the Lamb and the words of our testimony. We can show uh, through our testimony, through our life and how we live, uh, the difference between how a person in the world is and how we are overcomers of that, how we've been brought out of darkness into marvelous light, which can cause someone to, you know, start to follow Christ because of the life we live and the example of Christ in us can be shown to them. But I think, you know, after, I think it's just like anything else, you know, people that come into the church and after, you know, they, there's an expectation that, oh, I'm saved now. I ain't going to have no more problems. I ain't got no more troubles. Everything's going to be sweet. You know, everything's going to be great. And when trials come, when temptations come, when, you know, the enemy starts to raise his head in the church, some of those false teachings starts to come into the church. People get hurt by the flesh of people in the church. Then they start losing their trust and faith in God. So it was one of the past, one of our my my jobs as a pastor is to try to teach, preach, encourage believers to continue to walk in the ways of holiness. And so this is what Paul was actually doing when he wrote this letter to the Ephesian church. So let's do a quick review about three things that we need to know about Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11 through 22. That's what we were on last week. Uh, the first thing is, as Gentiles, we originally were far off from Christ, but were brought closer to God by the blood of Jesus. We were distant from God. We were not, or what we felt, a part of the equation. Um, I've heard it said, Michelle has spoken it, and a lot of us have, the, 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 uh, the Jews were the OCPs, original chosen people. Um, so uh, all First Testament uh, saints or those who followed uh, God were those who, the children of Israel, the Israelites, you know, and it wasn't until Christ came, his death, burial, and resurrection, but the blood that he shed for us brought us close to God or opened up the avenue, opened up the door, opened up the opportunity for we who believe to now become a part of the body of Christ. Jesus said it best in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believe, and you can stop right there. Whoever believes, it's all about faith. It's all about belief in God. He didn't say that, that only the Jews that believe or only the Israelites that believe, only proselytes, those who now become Jews, believe. But he said, but whosoever, that's the world. He loved the world. That's everyone. Uh, Christ is our peace is what we also learn. Going into verse 14. Uh, he doesn't describe peace. He is our peace. Um, the Bible says that if you delight yourself in the Lord, he'll give you the desires of your heart. So he also says that they, he will keep you in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on him. So he is our peace. Uh, I had a I had a brother once who was in a lot of confusion. And one thing that he talked to me about one time, he said, Malcolm, all I want is some peace. And he had a nice job, money, nice car, nice house, all the types of materialism that a person could want to feel satisfied. But he wasn't satisfied because he had no peace. And that type of peace that we need only comes through Christ. Then we learn from verses 19 to 22 that the church 
is a building. Christ is the cornerstone. And we are the stones that add to the foundation. He used the building as a metaphor. He is the Christ is the cornerstone. We're the stones that are added to the foundation. The building is the house or our building. We are the house of the Spirit of God. We're the temple. We are where the Holy Spirit dwells. He's not just hopping around in the atmosphere. The Holy Spirit has come to live and dwell in the temple of God, which is us. We are the stones that add to that building, that house, that that God used Christ to be the cornerstone. Like I say, I don't care what building is ever made, the very first block laid in the foundation is always the cornerstone. Everything that's built is built out from that stone or from that brick. If it's not laid properly, if it's not in the right position, the house will fall. Or if there isn't one, the house will fall. But the kingdom of God stands firm today because Christ is the cornerstone. So let's talk about what we're going to learn in today's lesson in Ephesians 3. The focus on chapter 3 is the mystery of Gentiles found in God's word. So when you think about the word mystery, um, I like a good mystery. I like a good movie that's got a mystery where you have to try to figure out the plots. I watch movies with Michelle and I love her very dearly, but there's some movies I don't like to watch with her because she can figure out stuff before it's really there. And she'll start to tell about what's going to happen. And I'm like, I'm the type of person, I don't want to know. I want to wait to the end and be surprised when I find out an ending. <laughs> That's what a mystery is all about. You have to take each nugget along the way and try to fit it into a place of what you see. So that in the end, now you've got the answer. Well, the mystery that we're talking about is a mystery in the Bible is a truth that was previously hidden or not fully known, but now was going to be taught fully or revealed that the God came not just for the Jews, but for the Gentiles as well. Again, in the First Testament saints, um, they had no idea that God really came for everyone. They thought it was just for them. That's why when we were reading and when we did the study in the book of Acts, uh, the temples, you, a Gentile couldn't come into the temple. If you let a Gentile in the temple, or you let a Gentile, or you even speak to a Gentile about the temple, you're in trouble. That's what got Paul in trouble at one time. Because he's teaching the Gentiles. He's trying to bring the Gentiles into the temple. And they were like, look, this is us. Y'all ain't got no reason being here. This has got nothing to do with you. It's all about us. But in chapter 3, we learned that the mystery is revealed. That it's not just for the Jews. It was hidden. But now it's being revealed and fully taught. And Paul was very instrumental in doing that. Chapter 3 also focuses on what the mystery is, why it is important, and how shall we live now as a result of knowing this mystery. You see, I growing up, I didn't know nothing but what we call holiness. You know, I, you know, I didn't know you know, that we, we didn't know anything about it from the First Testament. You know, but it was up, wasn't until Jesus Christ came that it was now fully understood and opened up that he came for everyone. So we're going to, it's going to, chapter three really focuses on that. So let's get into it. Starting in Ephesians 3, 
1 through 21. I'm going to read it in the New King James Version. I'm going to want somebody else to read it in the uh, New Living Translation. So verses 1 through 21 in chapter 3, it says, For this reason I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, for you Gentiles, if indeed you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which was given to me for you, how that by revelation he made known to me the mystery, as I have briefly written already, by which when you read, you may understand my knowledge of the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to his holy apostles and prophets, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel, of which I became a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given to me by the effective works of his power. To me, who am less than the least of all saints, this grace was given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable reaches of Christ and to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God, who created all things through Christ Jesus, to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places according to the eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus, our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through faith in him. Therefore, I ask that you do not lose heart at my tribulations for you, which is your glory. For this reason, I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, whom from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. <clears throat> he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with the might through his spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us, to him be glory to the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. That's a lot. Now, somebody read this for me in the New Living Translation. Remember when I think of all this, mm -hmm. I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus for the benefit of you Gentiles, assuming, by the way, that you know God gave me the special responsibility of extending his grace to you Gentiles. As I briefly wrote earlier, God himself revealed his myster mysterious plan to me. As you read what I have written, you will understand my insight into this plan regarding Christ. God did not reveal it to previous generations, but now by his spirit, he has revealed it to his holy apostles and prophets. And this is God's plan. Both Gentiles and Jews who believe the good news share equally in the riches inherited by God's children. Both are part of the same body and both enjoy the promise of blessings because they belong to Christ Jesus. By God's grace and mighty power, I have been given the privilege of serving him by spreading this good news. Though I am the least deserving of all God's people, 
he graciously gave me the privilege of telling the Gentiles about the endless treasures available to them in Christ. I was chosen to explain to everyone this mysterious plan that God, the creator of all things, had kept secret from the beginning. God's purpose in all this was to use the church to display his wisdom in its rich variety to all the unseen rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was his eternal plan, which he carried out through Christ Jesus, our Lord. Because of Christ and our faith in him, we can now come boldly and confidently into God's presence. So please don't lose heart because of my trials here. I am suffering for you, so you should feel honored. When I think of all this, I fall, into, fall to my knees and pray to the Father, the creator of everything in heaven and on earth. I pray that from his glorious unlimited resources, he will empower you with inner strength through his spirit. Then Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust in him. Your roots will grow down into God's love and keep you strong. And may you have the power to understand, as all God's people should, how wide, how long, how high, and how deep his love is. May you experience the love of Christ though it is too great to understand fully, then you will be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes, comes from God. Now all glory to God, who is able, through his mighty power at work within us, to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. Glory to him in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations forever and ever. Amen. 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 What a wonderful thing here. Um, so, uh, going back, Ephesians 3, 1 through 7, what is the mystery? The gen uh, that, the first thing about the mystery is that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and partakers of God's promises in, as we find out in verses five and six, we've now been made heirs and partakers of God's promises. Like he had said, it was hidden from generations before, but now it's being revealed that we are not left out in the cold. We're not just secondhand citizens. We are now heirs. That means our names have been written in God, in Christ, through the blood. The same promises that were made to Abraham and his descendants are us as well. God's plan for the Gentiles was included in Abraham's blessings. We find this in Genesis, the 12th chapter. When you get a chance, go back and read that. These are all the promises that God gave Abraham, the, the blessings. But we have been included in that, now being heirs and partaking of all the things that God has for the world. We become heirs and partakers by faith in Christ, not by ethnic origin. It's not by uh, our, our, our uh, relationship, who we are. We're not Jews, or it's not because of our race, our color, uh, whether it's male, female. Uh, it, it has nothing to do with any of that. Doesn't matter if you're American or you're Chinese, nothing. It has nothing to do with our ethnic origin. It's all about our faith in Christ. Based upon this, Paul justifies his calling to preach the gospel. Because if you notice, he's, this is Paul, and he's, he's going against the Jewish law and ritual, and he's preaching to the Gentiles, letting the Gentiles know, hey, wake up, you've now been included in this. 
before you didn't know, before nobody. Everybody thought it was just for one group of people. But you need to understand all the promises of the God who created everything, the creator of heaven and earth has given us all the same promise. It's got nothing to do with our blood. It's all about our faith. That's why you've got believers in every country in the world. Because it's all through faith. Some of the largest churches, they say, can be found in places like Africa and China. There are a lot of them are underground because to be shown who they are, they can die. But there are some countries that's got just tons of Christians. Because he said in the last days, I'm pouring out my spirit on all flesh. So the word of God is being spread everywhere. There are believers everywhere. And every believer, everyone who walks in the family of God, everyone who is part of the, the, uh, the universal church has the same promise, the same blessings as everybody else. We're all one. So why is this mystery important to us? Why is this, and somebody tell me, why is this mystery important to you? We've read it in two different translations. What did you get from that? And how is it important to you? Pastor, I think, you know, it's given each and every one of us to eat. Because eat now we can go to God but, personally. Hello? Yeah, I'm listening. Hello? Yeah. Oh, who, who may or... Hello? Oh, I think that the good Lord gives the equal playing ground of being uh, blessed with the same opportunities. Long as we have faith in him, we don't have to worry about living that old way of what we used to live and what we used to do and what we used to believe in. Because if we did, we couldn't, it's no common ground for us to, you know, to have faith or, or getting what the good Lord has blessed the, gent the, the, the Jews with. He wanted us to all be like you said, one, so we can walk together, be together, love together, worship together, and have faith in the same way that the Jews had, mm -hmm. we can have. Mm -hmm. We can have faith in the things that he has prepared for us, you know, far as the love, the trust, mm -hmm. and everything else, you know. Amen. Uh, uh, Victor, what did you, 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 were, you were about to say, what did you say, Victor? I was going to say that we all have the same opportunity to go before God yeah. with, you know, with our prayers and, and be blessed by God, the same as the Jews would be blessed. Mm -hmm. We're equals. Yeah. Yeah. There is, there is, there, there's no one better than the yeah. other. Yeah. Um, I, I, I know I've said it before that I always think about uh, Billy Graham and all the hundreds of thousands of souls that have come to God because of his outreach and his ministries during the time that he had all these crusades, man, and people just were falling and giving their lives to God and their lives were changed. And the power that this man had but what is so amazing is, is he had no more Holy Spirit than I got. Yeah. He had no more Holy Spirit than you have. We all have the same power and authority because this mystery was revealed. For us to understand and know that he came for us all. One, God now shares his wisdom and purpose of the church, the universal body of believers. That is what the church is. 
It's not the building. Pastor? Yes. Just real quick, if I may. I, I Reading through this, it's always amazed me that I, what I find amazing, what I find just absolutely so cool is the person who invite who is inviting the Gentiles into the church is someone who persecuted the Jews for being Christians. Right. <laughs> and it's a, it's a person who God gave the responsibility to that says, to me that says, in, in my mind, if I'm Paul, I'm saying, and he did, I the least of all the saints. Mm -hmm. Paul is saying, Let, I, have this, I have this really cool thing I want to share with you. I understand it better than anyone because I went out and did these horrible things and yet God still loves me. That's right. And I was an enemy to God. Yes. You guys, you, the Gentiles, have considered yourselves enemies of God, the, the, of, of the Israelites. The Israelites have considered you enemies of God. I was welcomed in. I am willing to share the, I want to share the news with you so that you can be welcomed in too. That's right. That's right. You know, I mean, you know, and that is, that is it's, it's so awesome that you said that, John, because it is so true. This is a man who spent, he was spending his career persecuting the Jew, uh, 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 the Jews. The church. The church. Persecuting anyone who came into what was called the way. They weren't called right. Christians. It was, it was called the way. And he was the main persecutor. He had him put to death, be thrown in prison. And now all of a sudden, here he is now, one who understood and understands the mystery because it was revealed to him. And God turned around and sent him to the Gentiles so that he could bring the revelation of that mystery. So if anybody knew the goodness of God, the forgiveness of God, the love of God, the power of the spirit of God, it was Paul. And the ability to have a personal relationship because he was struck blind, totally out of this world. Yes, sir. To have that relationship. Yeah, man. For his, for his training. Yeah, man. There's no way that he could ever uh, deny the existence of Christ. He had a relationship that was built upon a miracle. He has firsthand knowledge of one of the greatest sinners being forgiven by grace and welcomed in, into, the, into God's kingdom. And he showed it, yep. Yep. Because we have boldness, to, and this is what you said, Victor, and you, William, we have boldness, access, and confidence to go to Christ on our own through our faith. We don't have to go to the temple and bring a bull or a dove or a lamb for the sacrifice of our sins. Um, we come to church. I have an altar call. I ask for people to want to come up for prayer and I'll lay hands and pray on you. But you also have access to prayer to God on your own. Bible says that don't forsake the assembling of ourselves together as, as, as such as is the days are evil. So we do want that. And the Bible says that if you're sick, come before the elders, let them lay hands upon you or anoint you with oil. And, you know, the prayer of love and forgiveness will heal you. Yes. But what say you can't come to me? What say you can't call me? What say I'm, 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 you know, you call my phone and I'm busy and I, or I'm somewhere or my phone's somewhere and I, you can't even talk to me. Let's say I can't, I can't get in your presence. You have access to the throne yourself. That is what your faith is for. I'm here to help too. I, matter of fact, I need it. But I also have access to the throne just like you. I've got no more access to the throne than you do. That is what is so great about this mystery, that we now know how important it is that we have now been joined together as heirs, co-heirs with Christ in the family. 
and our tribulations now have meaning. This is something I really thought about because we go through things sometimes and it's kind of hard for us to understand sometimes why we go through some tribulations and trials. Some things are things we did and we had to go through them and learn lessons from some of the things we've done. But there are some trials and some tribulations that God allows us to go through because it brings honor and glory to him when others see us go through these things. And the first thing I thought about was Job. Job was a righteous man. Job was a man who God said was blameless. But it wasn't that Job went through what he went through to show how strong and how great Job was. It was more to show the authenticity and the power and the love of God that was in this man that showed how much he would not deny him. Because you see, at the end, he got back more than he lost. So some of the things that we go through, it's really to show the power and the authority and the awesomeness of God when we go through them. And that's the thing, too. So we have to go through some of these tribulations. We can't sulk around like, oh, woe is me. We have to have faith and knowledge of knowing that even in the midst of these tribulations, even in the midst of these trials, we know God's going to see us through. So we don't act like the world does, oh, woe is me. We know God has the ability to see us through to bless us, to deliver us, and give us what we need so that the world can see, not us, but the power of God that lives in us. That's what gives some of these tribulations meaning because it's for the glory of God. I think about when I was in the hospital and I was in the um, um, intensive care. I, it, I always said, you know, I didn't, I didn't know why I was there. They, you know, me, I didn't know. But according to the charts, according to the test, my body was in a condition to where I was about to die. I didn't know. I didn't feel it. But death was upon me. And they had to put me in this ward to be, do, ha have better uh, uh, visuals of me. But all the time I was there, I'm having joy, I'm laughing. I had opportunity to witness to nurses. I had opportunity, I had, I had a cleaning lady come by one time and she spent about 40 minutes with me, she was just supposed to come and clean, but she spent about 40 minutes and I had opportunity to witness to her and talk to her about the goodness of God. So it wasn't about me, even though I was going through things, it was all about the glory of God. It was all about God having me in a place during a time where I could do his work, his service. That's why we go through some of the things. That's why now your tribulations, they have meaning. They've got a reason. All to bring glory to God. <clears throat> so our group discussion, all centered around Ephesians 3, 14 through 21. So we've got questions and answers. So based upon the mystery, Paul prayed a prayer. When you read this, you see the prayer he prayed, 14 to 31. We're not going to go over it. But Paul prayed that God would be strengthened with his power through God's spirit in our what? Faith. 
Found in verse 16. Inner man. Inner man. Amen. It's not about the outward. It's all about the inner man. We um, think about how we try to take care of our bodies. Exercise, our diet, what we do for the outward man or what we do for our physical conditions, what we need to bring strength to that. Um, getting older, uh, we have more aches and pains now than when we wake up than we had when we were young kids. We don't heal as fast as we did when we were younger. Um, I thank God for my son who came and shoveled my driveway today. Yeah. I looked at it and I'm like, oh, shucks. <laughs> if I went out there and shoveled all that, we would not be having Bible study tonight. I'm going to tell you that now. <laughs> there would be no Bible study tonight. Michelle be rubbing me down and I'd be like that commercial. I smell like Walter. <laughs> <laughs> But it's not about the hour. <laughs> <laughs> you just got that, didn't you? <laughs> it's, not, it's, it's not the hour that needs strength, and it's the inner man. That means, that means we've got to feed the inner man every day, constantly, through prayer, through the word, through our faith, our trust. That's what strengthens the inner man. And then number two, that Christ may dwell in our hearts by what? Faith. faith. By faith. faith. It is our faith that causes Christ to be in us through the Holy Spirit. When we receive him, we know he lives in us. We don't always feel him. We have those joy moments when we know he rises up in us and we can feel this power and this authority. But we have certain days where I know, and I know I'm not the only one. We can go throughout the day and be dealing with so much of the of, of our own conditions and things that we deal with. And the Holy Spirit sometimes is not the focal point of what we have on our minds. And that's why a lot of times we find ourselves distant because we don't really understand that he is the focal point in our lives but it's through faith that we know he's alive and well in us we know he directs and guides us he talks to us i did i heard this morning i'm out here i went out at four o'clock i'm driving i pick up one person and it took me a long time to get this person to where I had to get them. And just as clear as I could, I know the Holy Spirit says, you're not going to make much money this week. So you might as well go home. Because I don't care how many calls you, you'll get a lot of calls, but it'll take you forever to get there. And you'll be just like this. When you may get three or four calls, you're not going to make a lot of money doing that. So why don't you pack it in and go home? And let me tell you, let me tell you how, how, how God blessed me. This, this one fair, the amount of money I got on this one fair was equivalent to about three fares that I would normally get during that same time frame if I'd have had better weather. I got the same amount plus a great tip on one fair. So I went, ooh, got your Holy Spirit. He will talk to you. He'll let you know he's alive in you. And through faith, we believe and we walk in that. And then lastly, in verse 20, that we would know that God is able to do exceedingly and abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the what that works in us. Power. 
The power. We said this last week. The same power that raised Christ from the dead is the same power that each and every one of us has in us to be able to do great and mighty things through Christ. We can do things exceedingly abundantly above all we can ask or think according to that power that works in us. I don't care how many things come into your life or you think you are unable to attain. Through the power of God that works in you, he's telling you. God in you is able to do these things through his spirit. Abundantly, exceedingly. According to the power that works in you. This is what he wants to do for us. He wants to work through us. People say he's God. He don't need anything. Yes, he does. He needs us to work through. That's why he created us. To be his glory. To work through us. He gave us dominion over the earth. He gave us power and authority to do things here on the earth that he created for us. So you've got power. You've got authority. God that lives in you makes you able to do great and mighty works through him. I'm talking about anything that comes your way. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Not some, but all things. I don't care what your situation is, you are an overcomer and are able to do great and mighty things because you got power. We've got authority. This is what God has given to us so that we can live as heirs, partners, join heirs with Christ, and have the ability to do what God has promised we can do. So let's deal with some closing points. Before I get to the closing points, anybody have any questions or anybody have any, any comments or something you want to add in your reading? Or is there anything that you read that you have a question about that you need an answer to? Okay. So our closing points. The mystery is that God created a new people, not by blood or ethnic origin, but by faith in Christ. He says, we now become a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, now all things are made new. Has nothing to do with, with, with blood relationship. I got cousins, I got brothers, I got sisters, I got auntie, uncle, mommy, daddy, none of that. It ain't about ethnic. We're all black. We're all white. We're all Asian. We're all Hispanic. It's got nothing to do with that. It's all because of faith in Christ that we all now have become new creatures. New people now have complete access to God by faith. Um, I, 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 I never try to, or I, I really don't, I don't come down on other religions. I don't, I don't talk about other uh, theologies and things of that nature. God has enabled Michelle and I to witness to a lot of Catholics. A lot of that I know and I believe because Michelle grew up that way. She grew up Catholic. But what I could never understand was going to confession. I, well, I, 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 it's not the going to the confession part that I didn't have a problem with. The problem that I had with was your absolution. You go get the rosary, say 12 Hail Marys, 10 Our Fathers, and now you're absolved of your sin. And I'm like, that, 
That just did not make sense to me. So the only way I could be forgiven of my sin was to go into this room, go into this box, tell this man what I did, <laughs> tell him how long it was since the last time I did it, and he tells me what I need to do by saying something, Hail Mary, full of grace, say that how many times, how many our fathers, which is a prayer, and now I'm good to go. And that's forgiveness. Honey, I'm... You picked up a lot. I am so surprised. You surprised? How are you surprised? <laughs> I, used to go, I used to go to Mass with Michelle when we first got up. <laughs> Even, well, one well, well, thing, Michelle's aunts and nuns, mother and all was there. The whole, whole family was Catholic. I'm going to pay her I'm going to go to Mass. If I go to Mass, I'll go. I didn't know you were Oh, I would take all that. Plus, I have friends here in Columbus that are Catholic. You know, so I mean, I, I I went to my first Catholic wedding way, I mean, years ago. And I mean, that's the longest wedding I think I ever been in. They had communion, all kinds of stuff. And I'm like, man, I ain't never going to another Catholic wedding. <laughs> you are, I mean, this is forever. I just go to Catholic church. I'm standing, I'm sitting, I'm kneeling. I'm standing, it's like calisthenics. <laughs> Well, I'm like, wow, this is deep. You know, I grew up, you know, danced around a little bit, clapped your hands, and it was noisy. It's quiet. Ain't nobody saying nothing. Wow, man, this is deep. Full of people. Full of people, and you ain't hearing a peep. Ain't no amens. Ain't no Bible flutter. Nothing. I'm like, oh, Jesus, where in the world am I at? You need to understand that when I was a kid, if you were caught making any noise during mass, yeah, and you went home from, when we got home from church, you had to sit in a chair while everybody else got to eat lunch. Oh, no. <laughs> After mass, we have lunch, and you had to sit in a chair and wait till everybody was done with lunch before you got to have lunch. Oh, my God. And the God. craziest thing is we, and when I grew up in Zanesville, we had this big cathedral um, that we went to, um, St. Nicholas, and it had, it was old, and it had these huge arches, and, and things echoed, and they had these old-fashioned metal hat clips. Do you remember these, Michelle, yeah. on the back of the pews that you could put your hat in? <laughs> honestly, like once a month, my, my little brother just could not take it anymore. He, he would be <laughs> so desperately, desperately uh, tempted and he would take one of those suckers and he would snap it and it would just echo through the whole place. And then he'd have to go home and sit while we all eat lunch. <laughs> it's amazing, it's amazing. It is so amazing. So, I mean, you know, you, 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 we now have complete access ourselves. You don't have to go into a room or go to confess your sins to them. come to me. You know, you can you got access to God yourself through faith. You can pray to God. You don't pray to Mary. You don't pray to Joseph. You don't wear, you know, the medallions and all. You know, you don't have to have a rosary. You go to God yourself. Because you now have complete access to God by faith. And then the I have a question. Go ahead. It's Heather. So in the Catholic religion, so I went to a Catholic school for a year. Mm -hmm. I was like a kid. And so I wasn't Catholic, so I got to sit while everybody did all the Hail Marys and all that. I, I was an observer. So at any rate, but one of the things they did make me do, I'll never forget. I was 11 years old. And they made me go to confession. They made all the kids one by one go into confession with Father Blah Blah of Notre Dame. And he asked me, you know, to confess my sins. And I'm mm -hmm. like, I haven't sinned. Right. <laughs> you got to go. What did you do? <laughs> 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 what did he say afterwards? <laughs> that lasted with me my whole life because as I've gotten closer in my walk with God, 
I'm trying to understand why would you confess your sins to man? Yeah. We're supposed to confess sins to God. Yes. Right. And so I guess, is there a piece in there <laughs> where it talks about church? Like, I'm just, it's something that I've never asked anybody before. Opportunities come up with this conversation today. But I'm just trying to understand because that's such a important part of that theology is there something in the bible where maybe i, I don't I, I don't know it just it's it's always mystery to me but i know i got in trouble over it so. <laughs> there there is a scripture that says confess your faults it didn't say sins it says confess your faults one to another pray one for another Ah, okay, okay, okay. That's what it says. Didn't okay. say your sins. It says <laughs> okay. Remember you know, that. You know, and, and 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 I think it's good today that each of us, you know, you find someone who you can confide in. Yeah. And you build up one another. Yeah. You know, you tell them what's bothering you. You tell them so that you have someone that you know can help pray with you over a situation doesn't mean it's a sin it can, it can be a trouble yeah that has bothered you you know and that's what the word of god is stating but people have taken that to say well you need to confess your sins yes leader but but see, it also does go back to, though, First Testament because the people had to bring their offering or their sin, they had to take it to the priest so the oh. priest could sacrifice okay. and be atoned for your sin. Okay. Okay. So, but with Christ, that was done away with. You no longer had to bring your sacrifice to the priest. You go yourself to God. Yeah. Okay. That's where it actually came from because God deemed it that way, that you had the priest who would take the yearly sacrifice for the atonement of man's sins to God through you either brought a dove, you had to bring a lamb, you bring a a, a, a bull or a ram, whatever you brought, and it had to be spotless, or it could not be deformed. It had to be pure so that your sins could be absolved that way. But man took it from that point of not just bringing something, but telling the priest or telling your sin so that he could take them before the Lord or tell you this is how you're absolved. It's just doctrine. It's just doctrine. All right. Thank you for that explanation. It's you been a weird you <laughs> talked to me. Maybe but, think of it. But we're new <laughs> people now. We're new people. We can do great things for God because of that power that is in us. We no longer have to rely upon someone else. We've got the Holy Spirit in us. We now have that power. We now have that authority to go before God, to hear from him, to follow his directions, for him to guide us in the way we should go so that we could do great and mighty things through the power. At a direct line. Direct line. Direct line. Yeah. <laughs> he yeah. My aunt that one time. Yeah. Uh, I was, she was here at the house once, and I had lost something in the house, and I was really fretting over it because it was something important. I don't remember what it was. Keys. Was it my keys? keys? And Sister Juanita said to pray to St. Joseph. Joseph that he'll help me find my keys. <laughs> and I, I was just... I'm like, I don't have to go to St. Joseph. I can go to God myself. I pray to Jesus. I pray to Jesus. I pray to Jesus. And she was outdone. She was like, oh, you got a direct line, I guess. I'm like, oh, yes, I do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Michelle had to take me out the room. She had to, she had to like, read me the line. I can't remember her that way. But I'm like, 
Saint Joseph? Who is Saint? Who is Saint Joseph? Well, I don't know no Saint Joseph. I got Jesus. I was. I got a direct. You know well, you got a direct line. I mean, yeah, probably. <laughs> <laughs> it was it was it was it was it was intense moments, but I, I, I've come to love her. She's come to love me. I love her dedication to God. It's it's phenomenal. And she's waking up. You know that you know she's had this dedication to God all these years, and you know there's things like that that I know in my heart of hearts that we're gonna be surprised at the people that we meet. <laughs> That we did not think would be there because they're not like us. Well, hey, the mystery has been revealed. It's for all who believe. So, for our next lesson, I want you to read Ephesians, the fourth chapter. We're going to study verses 1 through 16. We're going to talk about that. So, read ahead, get some knowledge. I I I uh, want you to look up different translations to so get a good understanding of what it's about, so that when we come together, ask some questions, give me some feedback. Um, let's do this, so that we'll be prepared to do what God wants us to do.